Um, what's up, everybody? It's Ulysses Owens Jr. I'm so excited to be with you today. Uh, I'm actually, a little fun fact, live from Dominican Republic. I'm in uh, Puerto Plata. Uh, I'm very grateful to one of my dearest, dearest friends who gifted me with a cool little mini vacay, and I truly mean mini, it's two days, and then I have to get back to my life. <laughs> and I'm also excited, I just finished uh, a successful jazz festival with Don't Miss a Beat, it was our inaugural jazz festival, and also our kids and production of In the Heights, so it's been a very, very busy time, but um, I'm really excited to be here with you. You know how much I love Open Studio and how incredible they are to me and um, everything that I'm all about with which is jazz and drums and music. Uh, for those that are new to Open Studio, they are an incredible online uh, digital platform, particularly for jazz and uh, jazz education. And so if you're looking to learn some really unique things from some of the best performers in the world, you want to tap into the vast network um, that is Open Studio. So I'm really honored to be one of their artists. Uh, I'm in really good company with people like, I think you've heard of Greg Hutchison and uh, some other wonderful musicians. I have a few courses out there, so you can definitely check that out. But today, I'm excited with my show uh, from the drummer's perspective, which really focuses on uh, the inside perspective of what it is to be a drummer, because many people talk about drummers and they talk about you know uh, what they need from drummers, musically speaking, but many times they don't understand what it is from our perspective to be who we are and also the role that we have to play in the music and it's been really great for me to kind of be a fan um, of all of these drummers that I love for so many years and kind of you know understand the behind the scenes process so um, this drummer he is one of the most dynamic musicians on the planet but he happens to be a very very dear friend of mine and I have to say that he got on the scene a little bit earlier than me and as I was kind of making my way onto the New York jazz scene he was always so gracious to me and so humble and it's funny because he and I have ended up on a lot of the same gigs so either it's his gig first uh, and he subs it out to me or it's a gig that I may have had at one point in time and people say hey okay Ulysses who do you recommend and uh, he's just one of my favorite people um, musically speaking I have to say that he has one of the most beautiful touch uh, touches on the drum kit and what I mean by that is you know anybody can hit a drum you take a drumstick and you can you know hit a cymbal, you can hit a drum, but it's, it's something when you can bring sound out of the drum. And I think the masters have that ability to bring sound out of the drum and paint and orchestrate with the drums. Uh, he also plays with some of the most dynamic legends in this music. Just a few people that we will talk about later, people like Maria Schneider Orchestra, who's won several Grammys. I think actually they, they just won the most recent Grammy uh, for her record, Data Lords our data lords, I should say, and he's on that record. Uh, also people like Kenny Barron, whom he's fresh off of tour, and we'll talk about all that. So without further further ado, I should say, um, one of my dear friends, a brother, a gifted, gifted, gifted human being, an incredible drummer and musician and band leader and composer. Please welcome Mr. Jonathan Blake Jr. What's up, What's everybody? Up, everybody? <laughs> What's man, up, dude? Man. What a heck of an intro. Heck of an intro. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. I don't know how I'm going to live up to that. Well, listen, you live up to it every day. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. So, man, man, so I know we're going to jump right in, but can you just tell us, you know, uh, what you've been up to? You you told me that you, you got some visine in your eyes because your eyes are red from Woo! getting back from Europe, man. So tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the most recent things. I was... Um, I was out with uh, the great Kenny Barron, uh, great bassist Peter Washington, and great vibraphonist uh, Steve Nelson. And we embarked on a three week summer tour. Um, and this was, uh, so I really just got back yesterday. So please forgive the red eyes. And I, you know, I'm like, <laughs> if I fall asleep on you, it's not my fault, it's this jet lag. But um, <laughs> yeah, we were, you know, we did about nine or 10 concerts four or five different cities. Um, but uh, I think it was really an important uh, tour to do, uh, just because being off for about 16, 17 months, uh, we, you know, we, we wanted to make a point to show the people that we're still here and we're still trying to bring the, the music to you despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in right now. So um, uh, I think it was just a beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful thing to do. and. And uh, the people were so appreciative. They've been starving for this music, and uh, to be able to see, you know, someone like Kenny Barron live again after not seeing him for for these uh, for over a year, um, 
you know, it was it was just a beautiful thing for them to experience. So, um, as I was mentioning before, I think a lot of the shows were pretty much all sold out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could look out in the audience and sometimes there were people with tears in their eyes. We played mostly standards, so it was, oh, nice. uh, you know, so it was a lot of material that people were familiar with and that they could really relate and connect to. And um, I think that's so important in general, just to be able to connect with, with the audiences um, around the world. So, um, yeah, I think it was very important, but uh, it was... Uh, it was a challenge, you know. I felt kind of like a rookie again. Now I haven't done it, and yeah. you know, so I looking at my back, I was like, "Oh shoot, I forgot this." I forgot right, this. right. I was like, oh man. I've, now, I've, I've, I feel like that happened to me too. You know, it's like oh, man. you're like getting you got like getting your road chops back. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, where's my toothpaste?" I was like, "Come on, man!" I'm like, Please. I was like, "Oh, rookie mistake." It was rough. So, <laughs> rough, but. I love uh, it. But uh, you know, it was, uh, I loved it. it. Was it was just so fun to be out. So um, okay. I'm glad I'm glad it worked out. Jonathan, can you tell me, man? Um, you know, a little bit, kind of letting the audience in on a little bit of what you and I talked before we went live. But can you just tell them a little bit of what you actually had to go through? You know, mentioning both of us talking about the the mini COVID test um, that you know even I have to take. You know, I had to take one this morning to get back tomorrow. But maybe tell like kind of let them in on like you know you were just playing in places like Italy that not even what six months ago we were all looking on TV and seeing tons of people leaving this earth right and so right. can you kind of tell the audience what was it like to be you know playing in places like you talked about Pescara or playing in you know Spain and going to these places that we we just not too long ago were witnessing um the travesty of what you know COVID was doing in their communities and in their country yeah I mean it was you know I you know the, you know when the when the pandemic first hit I was actually out it was it was um uh, embarking on another long tour and of course it was about another three or four weeks about a month actually and um we were looking on the news every day and and sure enough like italy was one of the epicenters of of the outbreak so to see where it's come you know to see where it's come how far it's come uh in a span of uh uh, you know you know a year a year it's it's just just amazing amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, because because yeah, it was just. Yeah, it was uh, just. Uh, it was so. You know, it was just so scary. Like we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I didn't even right. really think this tour was going to happen. You know, to tell wow. you the truth. You know, because right. it was just like every every la- you know every minute something was changing. It was like, okay, right. are we allowed to enter this country? Are we allowed to, you know, to be here to be there? And um, you know, sure enough, it they came together. So I, you know, I really. You know, tip my hat to the people of you know Italy. They're so resilient. Um, it actually kind of reminds me of um, my first time going back to Japan after the you know tsunami and uh, oh, yeah. of uh, 2011. I was I went back there maybe two months after that happened with uh, Cassandra wow. Wilson, and wow. we we played at you know the billboards there in, in, in Tokyo. And when I tell you, it was sold out. Just people just you know they like. They do what they have to do to to uh, you know to get you know to take them, I guess to take them out of what you know their hardships that they're going through. And I feel that's our job too as musicians that we have to uh, allow people to we have to take people and get them out of what their normal routine is and just help right. them relax and tell and forget about like the hardships that they that they're right. going through. So I think with uh, the Italian people, they like I said earlier, they're very resilient, and this was a way for them to like say, oh man, we, you know, we did, we did what we were supposed to do. And, you know, Mm -hmm. now we're seeing, now we're, you know, reaping the benefits from, you know, Mm -hmm. from what we, you know, what we had to do. So it was just beautiful. Cool. Cool. So, so man, I I am going to jump into your, your beginning in history, but I, I, I love the flow of us talking about touring. And, you know, one of the things that I like to, to deal with in the drummer's perspective is really giving tips to musicians and drummers out there. It's not just, you know, a, a, a nice, Uh, kind of antidote of your life story, which we all love that. But I feel like getting a chance to talk to a Jonathan Blake Jr. um, And for many that may never get to interview you, I try to keep myself in the mindset of people who may never interview you and ask those questions. So we talked about touring. You know, can you maybe give me, Jonathan, what are a few things that if you want to be on the road making music, you know, what should you be thinking about? And maybe what did you do to prepare? Because I know, man, you're one of the top working drummers and you have been for many years so you know so again just to simplify you know what are a couple tips for 
you know, cats who really want to get back out on the road and like what what to think about. And then sort of what did you do within your preparation and as a musician to be considered to be on the road as much as you are and working as much as you're working? Well, I think the first thing is really, um, you know, they say showing up is half the battle. So showing up and being prepared, you know. So if I'm going out with a Kenny Barron or, or somebody like that, I'm learning their music. I'm going to try to learn their whole book. So that it doesn't, so I don't feel like, or so they don't feel like they have a sub. Like I always wanted to feel like mm. I've been in the band for years. That's so great. that, so that was my mindset. Like I remember the first time I even got the call from Kenny, it was, it was the sub from my, you know, my hero Ben Riley, who, had, you know, who had kind of fallen ill, and um, so I just took it upon myself. I, you know, I purchased a bunch of his records and some that I had already had, and just studied the music for. You know, just live with it for a few months. So by the time that the gig came, you know, I was saying, "Oh, do you still do this tune, or do you still do this tune?" Mm. And he was like, "Oh man, you know that, or you know this." You know, so the you know that's one of the things like learning uh, the artist's repertoire, repertoire, mm. and 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 playing it like you wrote it almost. Wow. Uh, you know, that's 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 one of the big things that I, you know that I learned early on um, mm. about getting the gig and keeping the gig. Um, the other, the other thing is, is showing up on time, man, and, and, and being professional. Um, you know, you don't want to become lackadaisical and just, you know, and just, you know, kind of stroll in. Like I, you know, I always want to be prepared. I always want to be showing up on time. I don't want people to be waiting around for me because, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm late or whatever. So I try to be punctual as much as I can. And, uh, you know, of course, sometimes there's some unforeseen circumstances, but for the most part, it's just like really being there and really being in tune. And then once you and then once you've learned the music, um, you want to put your own thing on it. We're you know, we're we're, we're the ones that shape and, and color the music. You know, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, drummers are just supposed to keep the time. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, we're supposed to give the give the shape to the music. So mm. if you can learn the music inside out and then shape it and orchestrate it, you're going to be on the gig forever, you know, because they're they're going to they're going to like what you bring to the table. You know? So so Jonathan, how do you how do you create a balance? Right. Because I've been in those shoes, too, where, you know, you want to learn everybody's music. And you talked about, you know, internalizing the music and learning it like you wrote it to kind of unpack that a little deeper. Like, what does that actually mean? So like if we take one of, you know, like let's name what's what's one of Kenny's tunes that he likes to play uh let's let's take one of his tunes called Cook's Bay okay cool so so you have Cook's Bay right so you learn the recording of him and I assume Ben Riley playing it with him mm -hmm. it, so you learn the hits and then when you say learning it like you wrote it is that you know form is that you know um you know learning it like Ben played it like like can you maybe unpack that a little bit more sure. for the audience so yeah sure so yes number one learning learning all the hits on, that are in that tune, learning the feel of the tune, learning how uh, Ben played it, mm -hmm. and and then once you learn it and internalize it, try to figure out what what makes it unique to you. So like how you want to approach playing it, that's going to be different. Because the thing is, like if I just approached it the way Ben played it, you know, at the time, you know, Kenny could have been just like, well, why are you doing it the way he did it? I can just I can just call him if I want, you know, if I want that. Right. So. It's so it's about learning it, and then uh, internalizing it, and learning and learning everything about it, and then trying to put your own stamp on it. So with a tune like Cooks Bay, um, the vibe kind of has like a Poinciana groove to it. Um, so of course I you know I, I go back and listen to Vernell Fournier and how he approaches playing his signature rhythm, um, and then I and then I again listen to the record or I listen to the song. And then I listen to different versions of the songs, if there, if, if there are different mm -hmm. versions of it. And, and maybe some that are not even by, or that, or that don't even feature Kenny on it. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody else has recorded the tune and see mm -hmm. how they approach it. And then from all those different, uh, those different takes of the tune, I slowly start to develop my own concept about how I want to shape and orchestrate the tune. Man, I, I love that because, you know, it's funny. I, I feel like my first experience of that um, 
was with Kurt, you know, Elling when I first started getting into his band and and you know cuz like you, you know he had a history and you you worked with Kurt cuz you recorded on which record was that? Uh I'm on the last one that just won. Yeah, the Grammy. last one. Yeah. Yeah, see look at this cat, two Grammys in a year. Um <laughs> Can I can I take a lesson? Come with you, Mr. Jonathan. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, anyway, like, but, I got nine, brother. Sit on down. I'm like, okay. That's cool. That's cool. But, it, but, but, but anyway, but no, but I, and you know this with Kurt, because Kurt's so tapped into what the drummer does. But I remember that experience of him saying, okay, yeah, this is what Paul Wertico did, or this is what Kobe Watt Watkins did, but I want you um, on that. So I'm, I'm really glad you talked about that and from the perspective of mm. Kenny. Um, I, I want to kind of, you know, go back a little bit um, and, and just I'm going to I'm going to give you some names, man, from from Philly, because, oh. you know, I feel like having had a chance to work with some great musicians from Philly, you're from there. Um, obviously, your father, huge legend. So I'm going to first start with uh, tell us about your your upbringing in Philly with Love It Hines. Oh man, <laughs> he just cele- he just celebrated his seventy eighth birthday. Yesterday. What? So, yeah, so happy birthday! I swear he's a vampire because he looks the same uh, and from like nineteen ninety two or whatever when I first met him. Uh-huh. Um, but man, he was such an important uh, part of my uh, integral part of my of, you know upbringing in Philly. Um, you know, it's I, I as I get older, I, I see the importance of having these mentors and, and, and having these people that uh, take you under their wing, so to speak. Um, because I feel like now as things, as, as time goes by, a lot of those masters are not around much anymore. So um, I was so uh, privileged to have someone like him in my corner that really took the time to, to nurture and, and develop my, you know, develop my, um, playing my listening skills uh mm-hmm. really learning how to listen to music and tell us and, about that tell us about that what did he how did he teach you that oh man so he you know he would suggest like we would have weekly um rehearsals and if you know he if he would call a tune he would say okay i want you to learn this tune and 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 this is pre-internet so it wasn't right. like i could click the button and be like it was like <laughs> no you got to walk to the library see if they have that record Ooh. and stop you know or try to go to the you know record store and try to cop yeah. you know cop the CD or whatever. So, and if you didn't have it together when you came back, the, there was going to be a bit of a tongue lashing because you know he, he expected <laughs> you, you know he trusted you to do what was asked of you. So you know the, mm-hmm. you know it was funny like even you know myself, Jalil, Daoud, uh, even before us, Christian, uh, mm-hmm. Joey DeFrancesco, Robert Landon, Byron Landon. They all came up under him, and um, you know he was he was he was he's compassionate, but he was also stern, like because he knew he could see the talent in in, in in you before you could even see it yourself. So mm. he wanted to nurture that, but he wanted to make sure that you were you were serious about it. So mm. he didn't really tolerate like too much goofing off. So okay. he, if he told you like to check it out, yo, you better go check it out. So. Okay. Uh, you know, so I remember like early on learning like some Mingus tunes that I didn't know mm-hmm. and 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 just trying to, you know, try to figure out. But his thing was like, get inside of it. Just listen to it. You know, listen to listen to how the bass and the drums are hooking up. Listen to that. Wow. Listen for that. Listen to the melody. See if you can pick wow. up um, parts of the melody. Try to play that on the drums. Try to play part of the melody wow. on the drum. So all that was like. You know, maybe at the time I didn't really necessarily understand what he was, why he was telling me this. But in fact, he was giving me um, the the necessary tools to learn how to to uh, decipher music quickly and and, wow. and to and to learn how to get inside the music quickly. Wow. Um, and uh, so, you know, and this, I just for me, it was just between him and my father, it was just such a blessing. You know, we were, okay. you know, we were kids. We were, I think. I was maybe 13 or 14 when I started playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and when I joined the group, I think Jaleel was like 10 or 11 when he wow. when he jumped. So we were we were kids, man. So, you know, of course, there were some playing, but, you know, it was it was an atmosphere where he made it. He made it fun for us to learn. Like, you know, it was like okay. we never it never felt like 
a chore or something. It was like, man, right. we were just so excited to learn each week. It was like, okay, which tune are we going to play now? And, and, uh, and then he right. would just, it was just beautiful. You know, we were learning Mr. PC or, mm. or uh, you know, Along Came Betty or, what, you know, whatever. You know, we were learning a lot of, uh, uh, the trumpet player Daoud was really into Lee Morgan. So we were learning mm. Lee Morgan tunes and, and all those heroes from Philly, you know, Hank Mobley. Uh, mm. You know, so uh, for me, it was just a great introduction um, to to this music that that uh, that we both continue to play and love. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I asked that because I'm sure you have a lot of uh, students as well. But that's the one question I get asked a lot, like, how do I listen? So mm -hmm. to hear that that was something that you pretty much started your journey with is really cool. Um, you also brought up. Um, the man who's literally responsible for you sitting here, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, figur figuratively and and musically and metaphorically and all in between. Um, what do you? I, I should say this because I know you've done a bunch of interviews, Jonathan, and you've been out here for years. What do you want us to know about your father that you may not have had a chance to share and his influence on you musically? I mean, I think the number one thing was that he was just a compassionate and, and beautiful person, man. He uh, Oh, there he is. You know, he, he opened it, you know, he, he never showed bias to anybody. Uh, he was just very patient and very, um, very supportive to everyone. You know, mm -hmm. everyone was equal in his book. And, um, mm -hmm. and he, he tried to find the good in everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so he was, he was just a consummate professional. He was, you know, he was a loving father, you know, I have two younger sisters and, um, you know, to, to him, he was, to us, he was just dead. But, you know, to, to other people, he was this great artist, this great jazz violin who kind of changed the, the shape, the way jazz violin was played. Because, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before him, there weren't too many violinists that were able to play with McCoy Tyner, you know. So, wow. you know, so from going from Grover Washington Jr. for three years and then McCoy Tyner for five years, um, he really kind of helped change the shape. And I feel like bring, bring the violin and, and more of a prominent light, jazz violin prominent light. Um, the other thing that I, I really loved about him is that he was an avid collector of uh, oh. vinyl. Vinyl. So in our house, in our house in Philly that I grew up in, he he had a, a little small studio built in the basement of the house, wow. and and he had this amazing stereo system, um, and vinyls like kind of going around the room in a way. So uh, as I got a little older, I would just go down and. Uh, you know, after school, come home and go down in the basement and just fumble through all these different records and just put it on and 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 just be transported to a different world. Um, I remember at times that um, I used to love the stereo system because it had the setting where you could play the music downstairs in the basement, and we also had speakers up on this you know second floor. So if I really wanted to make my mom mad, I would just blast it. <laughs> You know, so they could everybody hear what I was listening to, but wow. uh, you know, for me it was just a beautiful experience. And my father, he was never one to force anything on his kids. So, but he was the type of person that once he saw that you showed an interest in something, he was going to cultivate that. And 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 so once once he showed once he saw that I was showing an interest in uh, this music, he he really said, "Okay, look, man." Here's your assignment. Go and check this record out. Go and get this mm -hmm. record with with your allowance. And so, um, so little by little, he 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 kind of helped me build my you know my, um, my not my catalog, but my 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 um, my CD and my my record collection. Yeah. 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 So um, no, it was just amazing, and I I, I love that because I I never wanted to. I don't want to be forced to do something like I, I want to do it because it's, it's out of love. And, and, um, so to have somebody that was supportive, but did, wasn't forceful with it was really exactly what I needed. So, um, cool, yeah. man. Can you tell me, um, cause I, I'm going to ask you a little bit, you know, obviously about your drum journey. Cause I have a, a couple of stories that some people told me, so I want to confirm some stuff, oh, but, I, but I want to know, was there any connection between your dad and Noel Pointer? at all being that they both played violin and I was just curious about that yeah they were they were really good friends actually um, okay I think Noel had come over to the house a few times 
I think Noel was slightly younger than my father, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Okay. Um, but Noel was was um, you know Noel was just equally uh, an amazing artist. But he 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 looked up to my dad, and they you know they talked. That's what I figured. They, they talked a lot, and um, you know because Noel was coming more of uh, out of the. I don't want to lack a better word like smooth jazz or kind of fusion, mm -hmm. and you know my father, you know having played with you know likes of Grover and then coming out of the sixties and seventies, he was you know he's right. inspired by that music too. So a lot of his writing, uh, you know, when he first started writing was influenced by that music. So um, I think you know I think uh, yeah, Noel really took a liking to him too because. You know, first of all, there's a few jazz violinists out there, but there's also a few, very few African-American jazz violinists right. out there. Right, right. So I think that was a, um, you know, I think that was a personal, uh, a, a really important part um, of them, you know, kind of becoming really good friends. Okay. Because I, I know um, Noel's daughter, Danae. Um, oh, okay. Um, I met her. Yeah, I met her through some other great friends in Brooklyn. And so I, I was wondering about that. Um, I, I, you know, you, you talk about your father and how encouraging he was. So I, I heard this story because, you know, me and you both work with Russell Malone. Oh, Lord. Uh, great. You know, that, exactly. Um, this is a PG story. <laughs> but, he, but, but, right, yeah. <laughs> but he told me this kind of I, I don't know if it, it was a story more so than it was just some truth that. Um, that you kind of had, I guess, a rough time kind of finding your way when you were younger. And I guess. He was saying, I guess, through the drums, you may have that kind of helped you to find your focus or like, you know, is there any truth to that? Or like because there's been some stories I've heard circulating around like the, the drums really were that thing that kind of helped you to find your way and, and purpose in life. But but I, I, I don't know how much you want to speak to that and also letting us know, like, how did you discover the drums? You know, being that I mean, shoot, it would have been easy for you to be another violinist or, or you know, <laughs> play string instruments or whatever. So just curious about that. Well, I did start on the violin. I got my first violin when I was three years old. And um, I was, okay, this probably, you'll probably hear about this, but I was on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah, I, yeah I was, that was my next question because okay. I, I, I saw the picture. Oh, <laughs> God, yeah. So I was on Mr. Yeah. Rogers' Neighborhood with my father. Uh, so, yeah, I did start on violin, and, um, and I played it up until high school. And then in the high school, it was, like, where I really wanted to focus playing drums. Um, but I'll preface that by saying, um, very early on, I was, you know, even though I was playing uh, violin, I was always fascinated by rhythm. You know, there's mm -hmm. stories of my mom and, and and my dad telling me, like, I would, like, take the pans, pots and pans out of my mom's yes. cupboard and, like, kind of line them around mm -hmm. <laughs> as a drum set and try to, like... Uh, listen, you know, I would listen to whatever was on the radio or if my dad had tapes and then I would start, you know, just trying to create a rhythm from what I was hearing or, you know, trying to clap the rhythm or beat the rhythm to what I was hearing. Um, so I think in a way, even though I didn't start out on drums, I think um, I think it was always there. Um, and so I uh, what, what wound up happening, the way I started playing drums was... Um, and in elementary school, uh, they had an orchestra, and I was playing violin in the orchestra. Mm. And, in around, and in around fifth grade, I think I was nine or ten, um, one of the teachers, there was like a, uh, I guess there was like an assembly program, and they were trying to start a full-fledged music program and within the school, which meant there was going to be, a, you know, there was the orchestra, but there was also going to be a concert band, and, and maybe like a jazz band. So basically they were they were trying to recruit students. Um, and so I was like, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, all right, man, this might be my opportunity to get drum lessons, you know? So what happened was they had, uh, you know, they had people who were interested, they had them stay after the assembly. And then you had to take like this, I guess this kind of proficiency test. If you mm -hmm. did well on the, on the test, then you were able to select what you wanted to do and they would set you up with uh, lessons uh, with mm -hmm. uh, with whatever with whatever instrument you uh, chose. So uh, I scored high on the on the test, and teacher came to one of the classrooms I was in, and they took me outside. And they said, "Jonathan, you did really well uh, on the test. Um, 
we would like to offer you to uh, be in the band. What do you want to play? And of course, I'm like, no brainer, drums. I want to play drums, you know. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so what wound up happening is they 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 said okay. So they they set up lessons, weekly lessons with a with a drum teacher there. His name was Mr. Balella. I don't know how I still remember that, but uh, and so from from uh like after school i would just start taking lessons on drums and mm. you know at that point i wasn't really i i couldn't really read music um you know i i had always had really good ears so i could always hear hear something once and be able to play it right back but as far as like reading even reading violin music i you know i was i couldn't really do it mm. so uh mr Bellella, he he really worked with us you know he it was it was myself and two other students uh, that started taking drum lessons. So um, I just really started pinging up and started learning, uh, learning how to read music. He he was very he was very uh, patient uh, mm -hmm. at times, and then other times he was, <laughs> if we were slacking off, he would go off. Um, yeah. But you know, we when I when I went to this um, elementary school, it was also like these feeder schools. So like. You go from this one school to the middle school, and the middle school is right. like a continuation of, you know, the the same type of curriculum. So uh, once I got to middle school, I was already I had already started playing drum set. So I started playing in the jazz band there when I was in sixth grade, um, and then around that time, I think that's also when I started um, uh, playing outside of school with the with the mm -hmm. Lovett Hines Ensemble. And that was okay. also a, a, another way of uh, just being inspired because there was also um, kids my age that were into the same thing that I was into. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, tying that back in, I think that's where uh, maybe Russell was speaking about because, you know, I think I had been telling them sometimes like growing up, I kind of felt like an outsider because, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, my friends and peers, we were listening to, you know, Biggie or, or mm -hmm. Pac or whatever. And I'm up here like, Yo, man, check out this Lee Morgan junk, man. You know, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. you? you know, so yeah. for me, it was just very beautiful to be able to connect with people that were around my age that were kind of checking out the same stuff that I was checking out okay. and really uh, and really just um, encouraging and, you know, and, and uh, you know, not being, you know, not brushing me off about, oh, you're into that stuff. But it was like a really open dialogue. Like that, so, yeah. No, interesting. Now, I know you and I, Jonathan, are really part of kind of, I feel like one of the first major generations that much of how we got onto the scene, I mean, your your story is pretty special, but was still through college, right? Like, I know you went to William Patterson. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, what do you have to say about the journey of college and also, you know, you studying with John Riley? Because, you know, I didn't study with John, but he was very integral to kind of putting me on the path of pursuing to be a jazz drummer um so you know having gone you know now we're kind of we've gotten from the beginning of your journey you know we talked a little bit about you know how you got exposed now we're getting ready to to understand like the evolution of who you are today you know uh, right. so so what did john teach you what did you learn at william patterson why did you choose william patterson and not say manhattan school of music or new school even though mm. i know you ended up playing with all those guys that that went there because you're I think you're also in that same generation where some of the um, pretty famous, you know, cats in our generation um, were there. So, you know, any, any of that that you want to share with us, kind of your journey and 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 I think also, you know, do you feel drummers today need to go through college, you know, especially given COVID and all that? So I know it's a loaded question, but, hmm. you know, any any facet of that that you want to share with us? You know, cool. well, you know, a few things. I think, again, I, I think I will go back to um, talking about the importance of mentors. Um, mm -hmm. so, so a mentor of mine that I met early on, even before I went to school, uh, was the great bassist Rufus Reed. And, wow. uh, and Rufus was um, the head of the department, the jazz department at William Patterson. So I had built a relationship with him through going to summer camps that he was teaching at, um, even before I, you know, you know, maybe early on in high school, maybe before I was in high school. So um, I always loved his approach about how he, he dealt with the students and how he got the students to really learn. And and so um, when I did graduate from high school, I, I tried out for a Manhattan school and got in. 
and um, and tried it out from Wayne Patterson. And what, what my decision on you know on going to Wayne Patterson dealt with two things. It was one like I really wanted that individual attention because I think that was mm-hmm. something that I needed to help me like really focus and and um, put me on the right path of uh, how to become a professional musician. You know. Um, even though I would have been doing gigs in Philly, but just really being on that path about like we talked earlier about getting the gig and keeping the gig. Mm-hmm. So, um, Wayne Patterson um, was a, a smaller, um, a smaller, uh, had a smaller department. Like the jazz department was very small. So I knew I would get that, uh, you know, that individual attention that I needed uh, to help. To help me, and then the second thing was having Rufus there. Um, you know, I kind of felt like, oh, I have somebody that I know look out for me, who's going to be that mentor and kind of take me under his wing, and that's exactly what it did. So, um, you know, before I will say before I even um, talk about John, um, just having Rufus there was uh, mm-hmm. was really that deciding factor. Um, and I wound up being in a couple of ensembles that he coached early on, and um, and he, you know, he broke my whole thing down. I remember one time I was playing really? like, a, oh yeah, I was playing in a Horace um, Horace um, Silver ensemble, <clears throat> and you know, for maybe a couple of weeks we were playing, and all of a sudden I walk into the ensemble, and there's no drums there; it's just a cymbal and hi hat. Uh oh. And, and this, and he was like, "That's all you got." for the next few weeks. Let me see how you deal with that. He's like, you're going to work on your clarity on the instrument, or on, on the cymbal beat and, and, the, and, the, and the hi-hat. Once that's locked up, then I'll allow you to bring some of the other stuff in. And um, so that's why, that's how he did it. He broke me down, man. He, you know, so for a few weeks, I was trying to make the band swing with just the hi-hat and the, and the cymbal. And then eventually he's like, all right, bring the bass drum in. <laughs> so that it was like hi-hat, wow. cymbal, bass drum. All right, that's cool. Bring the snare drum in, but it was that. It, that's exactly what I needed at that time to really mm-hmm. help me help focus and center my playing. And so when I got with John Riley, um, that you know it just increased even more. You know, we did a lot of um, we did a lot of um, independence uh, work. You know, really having all you know, getting used to having all four limbs doing stuff. Mm-hmm. We did a lot of different. Rhythmic stuff. He had me transcribing like like these South African rhythms, uh, nice. transcribing Elvin, Tony, okay. um, and really just breaking everything down. And and the thing that I really loved about about John and, and in turn what I try to bring when I'm teaching is John is not only an amazing player, but he knows how to really break down everything so that even if you're not a professional musician you can understand where he's coming from and you can understand how to get to that point Um, because he just has a way of, of doing it so that everybody understands. And, and that's, and to me, that's a really special thing because there's a lot of great, great musicians who are terrible teachers. And, you know, so to be able to be a great instructor and a great player, I I think that's uh, just an amazing feat. So I try to, to, um, you know, to take, you know, to take um, my, 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 well, to just to, to take uh, some lessons from him. I just really learned a lot from him and I try to share that information that I learned from him with, with my students and really try to break it down like that so that, yeah. you know, even if you're a very beginner, you know, you know exactly what to do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for those that aren't hip to John Riley, um, I actually plan to have him on the show soon. But, you know, he's the creator and author of several books that literally shook up the jazz industry uh, and drum education industry, like, you know, The Art of Bop Drumming, which I don't think I would have learned what comping was, you know, right. without him. And then also you had uh, Beyond Bop Drumming. Um, and and to your point, John has a way of taking a lot of the language of the masters and the elders and kind of distilling it down to like, you know, uh, an exercise. You right. know, right. Um, so that's really hip. Um, before we move into your career, which I, you know, I I, I got some questions um, for you, <laughs> but tell you, you know, I saw you, you know, because part of my thing with the show is obviously all, all y'all I know, right? Your friends. 
but I also am always looking for new information. And I saw Horace Arnold, who mm. was one of your instructors. And I have to say, I don't know much about him. And I've seen the name through the years in New York, but can you maybe just give us a brief kind of description of like who he is, what he taught you, um, because everybody knows about John, but I, I'm not hip to this this cat. You yeah, know, I, actually, Horace was like the um, my first instructor when I instructor when I got to William Patterson. So I studied with him for about two years. Um, yeah, he's he's kind of one of these unsung heroes, man. Uh, but he worked with Mingus for a while. Wow. Uh, uh, he he was kind of more thought of as a fusion drummer. He has he had two records that come out, I think, in either late 70s or late 60s or early 70s. Um, mm. I think they were on Columbia, man. Some really great kind of more like fusion uh records, but really killing. Okay. Um, but there's a few there's a few um, drummers who have come out, of, you know, from studying with him. One was uh, the great uh, uh, drummer Will Calhoun. Who's played? Oof. Yeah, who's, yeah, you know, who's played with. We, me and Nate Cone. just talked about him last week, bro. Oh, get out, man! Yeah, yeah, Nate was saying how much of an influence Will is um, on his playing as well. So that's interesting. I got to, I got to interview him because he's come up a few times. Yeah, no, Will. I mean, and uh, you know, like I, you know, I had heard the name, but I didn't really know him that well. And Horace re was really one of the cast that, like, yo, you got to check him out. I mean, mm -hmm. I, went, I remember when hearing Will live somewhere in New York, and just I just flipped out, man. I think you know, I think I had went to go see uh, the group he played in at the time, Living Color, and um, yeah, yeah, I just, I just, I just, it just blew me away. But no, um, yeah, I mean, Horace was an amazing instructor, man. Like he, um, you know, he was he he played, he might even play with Miles for a minute. Like he he did a bunch of different things, man. That that people are not really aware of. Um, uh, so for me, what I learned from him was just like the basis of really how to, uh, uh, how to keep really good time, uh, mm -hmm. how to internalize the time, right. um, you know, and once you internalize it, being able to stretch it and, and, and contract, you know, like all those things he really taught me because he was heavily um, into Elvin too. So, um, and, mm -hmm. and Tony for that matter. So, uh, so yeah, uh, he's yeah he's if you if you don't know him, guys check him out. He's ridiculous, Horace Arnold. Uh, uh, I you know I really I really uh, give it up to my you know we kind of lost contact for a while and then during this pandemic I was trying to make it a point to just really reach out to um, some of the people that you know had really made lasting impressions on my on my life so he was one of the people that i reached out to matter of fact what happened was i ran into will calhoun and and i was like yo man i i need i need horace's number again do you have it and he he emailed me right away and so i was like all right nice. cool. and so i just got back in touch with him he's still he's still in new york he's still doing well Nice. So, um, Good. Yeah. He and he and, and actually, I want to also add. He was one of the first cats that I saw that started using triggers on the drums. Really? Yeah, man. I had never seen this. This is like uh, maybe late '80s, early '90s. I used to go to this jazz camp with my the summer camp with my father called um, what was it called? Artist Teachers Institute. It was held at uh, Stockton State College, and mm -hmm. and he was one of the instructors. And um, yeah, he had these triggers on his drum that would like trigger all these different like uh, clips that he would have. Like you know, I remember one time it was you know it was, I don't know where he got these clips from, but it was like something about like man, we got to flee, we got to flee. So every time he would hit the drum, it, this sound would come up, or this or this this uh, this statement would come up. We got to flee, we got to think about this, and then so it was like you know it was just really amazing. Like that early on, somebody thinking like that and and, um, mm -hmm. and really trying to almost being ahead of his time so yeah no that's dope well i got to get both of those cats in the show um man i, I want to ask you jonathan you got to tell me about your setup you know your symbols hanging all over your drums <laughs> you know but I, I i sat on your setup and and i didn't know what to do and and <laughs> i did this really cool video actually of uh antonio sanchez i think you posted him <laughs> oh, on, yeah. on, on, your, on your drums and he's like you know <laughs> Doing the thing. So, you know, as we evolve into your journey, your career, and kind of talking about 
the different people you worked with. I, I got to talk about your setup. Also, I know you've been with Yamaha for many years. I was with them for a period of time, but I felt like you and, and a few other drummers, y'all really built the sound of your drums with Yamaha. You've maintained that. So maybe just, you know, give us a peek into, you know, why you use what you use, why you set up the way you set up, because mm -hmm. I think it's very unique. Um, and I, I don't know that I've seen anybody set up like that. So, yeah, I mean, that setup actually comes from, um, you know, when I was in high school, I started playing marching band and, um, or like drum corps. And so, um, I, I was on snare drum from ninth grade up until the time I graduated. Right. So, um, I always got used to having the snare on this harness and having it right there. Wow. So almost like being over the instrument. Cause I always felt like, man, there's so much control when you're over the instrument as opposed to like kind of being under the instrument or like okay. having to reach for the instrument. Okay. So what I, you know, so what I started thinking about, it's like, man, I wonder if I can kind of get to that same kind of concept with the, with the all, you know, with the whole kit. And so what wound up happening is, um, I started doing like research and I started checking out videos of uh, a lot of older drummers, like anything that I could find, like chick web stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. um, who else? Uh, even like some buddy rich stuff. Uh, okay. And what I found was like a lot of those cats, um, they would keep their symbols very flat, maybe not as low as I had it, but it was flat. So it was like, it was like, they were just kind of like, you know, it was like they, you know, it was like kind of an extension of themselves. Like they would just stretch out their hand and everything was right there. So I was wow. like, man, that's, I was like, man, that's a really interesting concept. And then I started thinking about, well, that's the same type of concept when, when you see pianists over the piano or vibraphonists over their yeah. instrument. It's like, they're not like, oh man, I got to go all the way over here or I got to go all the way over here. Like everything is like kind of arm's length. So I said, man, I wonder if I can do that same kind of concept. So what I started doing, I started experimenting with, setting up the the stool kind of high yeah. um, and kind of like getting that feeling of kind of like looking down at the instrument, kind of being over the instrument. And I said, man, I kind of like that, you know? And then I was like, okay. And then what happens if I lower the cymbals? Yeah. And I was like, oh, shoot, man, everything is right here. So it's like, I'm not, okay. I'm not having to like reach for it, you know, and I'm not overexerting myself and like getting... Uh, getting super tired because that was one of the things that I was finding. I was like, man, like I'm playing, but I'm like, I feel like I'm, you know, exerting so much energy that I, you know, right. like I feel like tired, and I, I don't want to feel like that. I want to feel like I, you know, like I have, you know, nonstop energy that I can just keep going. So when I lowered the, you know, when I lowered the cymbals, I was just like, man, everything is right here. I don't have to really think about it. It's almost like when you're when you're at the stove and you're cooking and it's like, yeah. you know, yeah, it's like, you're not going all the way over here to get the, the salt right. or, you know, right or, up in it. Yeah. Every, so it was like, kind of like that same kind of concept. It was like, man, everything is right here. Um, so I don't have to really think about, I, you know, I can close my eyes and say, okay, yep. Tom is here. Four Toms are here. You know, uh -huh. symbol, the ride symbols here, other symbols here, another symbol here. And it just made it so much easier. So now like, when I sit at the instrument, I just feel, you know, I feel so much more relaxed. Like, I don't feel like it's an effort to try to, to, uh, to force what I'm trying to do. And, and it also really, it really impacted the way that I, that I approach touching the instrument. Like, it, you know, like I, I really developed my touch when I started setting up like that and really, you know, was really aware of like, okay, I want to be able to play in different rooms. So if I have this control of the, of the kit, I can control the sound that's coming out and, and control how much I give, how much I don't give, you know what I mean? So it just made it so much easier to execute wow. that. So, okay. uh, yeah, so it did come out of that marching band and then, you know, those the watching the old drummers, how, you know, how they set up and, and pianists and, and vibraphones too. Nice. And then, uh, and then what's the deal with like Yamaha drums? Uh, you know, I love I love Yamaha. I've been with them for whew, I don't know how many years now. Um, but they they uh, you know they make such consistent instruments, man. And and for me uh, as a drummer who travels quite a bit, that's one of the things that I need to be consistent. You know, it's like if I can if I can get drums that I know how to get the sound out of them, and you know I know what they're gonna I know what it's gonna be. Then that's one last thing that I have to think about when when I when I 
go to hit the stage. So um, yeah, I've been you know I've been with them uh, with you know for a lot of years, and I've worked with them on different things, and they've studied uh, I guess certain clips of me playing, and really, really yeah, really learned how how I hit the instrument, and, and you know, I've, and made some stuff pretty close to you know to to what I you know to what I need from from the instrument. So okay. and I like the fact that they are very consistent you know you know even from the low end stuff that the two that they have out the low end models of drum but all the way up to the high end they remain pretty consistent so um nice yeah i, I really did and i know you were with them for a while yeah um, yeah i mean i think you know i, I was to me me and um nate talked a little bit about you know i think it's all about where you are and and their investment in you you know and i think you know like i'm glad right. that they're able to uh to to do do some great things for you because you know now Tama is able to do that for me you know but I think right. where I was at that time I mean I think they already had you and you know Kareem and a bunch of other great guys so um but I, I still to this day even though I don't play their drums I still think they're one of the most dynamic um and consistent drum makers in the world you know oh, totally, so totally. and and I think you have built such a great vibe with them like I love the clip you put up the other day I think of this like a little I guess their new little kit. It was like a small. Oh kit yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that set up over here now. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, it sounded great. It sounded great. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. Like I, you know, that's you know, I, that's not like a super high end model, but it's like it's it's consistent and it and it sounds good. I've used it on gigs outside, and it you know feels good to play, yeah. and it and it sounds good. I you know, of course, I you know, I do little tweaks here and there with like getting certain heads and, and, and stuff like that to, to make it more, um, you know, to make it more of my own sort of speak. Um, right. but you know, I, you know, I can, re I can usually get to what I'm trying to get to with, with the drums that they, that they have made for me. And I, um, and I, you know, I just, I really appreciate them because they, you know, they, they were with, you know, they, they, they took me on when, you know, nobody else would, you know, they really, took the time and they and um they've been a really great you know great company to work for so um, okay. yeah I, pre I appreciate what they're doing so, no that's great man so i i'm gonna just announce a few people you play with and i want you to tell me something you've either learned from playing with them or something they've taught you so uh first tom harrell oh man tom uh i've learned about patience and pacing from tom um, if you ever go to see him play, um, he takes his time, man. It's, it, he's never in a rush to get anywhere, man. And that, and for that. me, that, I, that's a beautiful thing to have. And, um, you know, even to the point, like, where we're watching him count off the tune. Like, before he even counts off the tune, he's singing it in his head. Like, you can see his mouth and his, his yeah. head kind of moving so that he gets it exactly right. So it's not like one, two, one. It's like... yeah. Let me pause for a minute, and and then yeah. he and then he sets it up, and I think that's so important. You know, we you know we have to, you know, sometimes we have to take a step back and say, look, let's 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 take a pause and like really figure out how you know how this is going to work. You know, and I I've really learned about pacing and and patience with with with, with Tom. So it's been okay. a beautiful thing. What about the Mingus Orchestra? Wow, that was. <laughs> I think it's big man. That was uh, that was a oh, big was, band. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was I was super young. I think I was nineteen or twenty when I joined the band, and um, just being thrown in there was like you know it was kind of like baptism by fire, man. Like you really learn how to uh, push the band and and uh, you're dealing with fourteen different attitudes and you're really trying yeah, that, to navigate through that. And and that's a raucous band, bro. Oh, bro. <laughs> That's, you know, I always say if I can if I can make it through that, I did ten years of that, and you know, I remember doing tours for like eight weeks at a time. Ooh. If I can survive two months with them, I can then do I can play in any band. But uh, the one thing I will learn is like I I really learned how to how to shape the band, you know, from mm -hmm. big from being in, you know, I, uh, you know, what I was playing with veterans like Andy McKee on bass and and mm -hmm. and. and uh, great john hicks on piano and then you know another rhythm section would be dave kakowski and boris kozlov and so mm -hmm. I, I really learned how to shape that band and, and um 
make the presence felt, you know, like, and it wasn't so much about like being as loud as possible. It was really about like how to get in there and, and make yourself heard, but not, you know, or make yourself felt, but not necessarily always heard, you know what I mean? Right, so, right. You know, so, um, that, you know, it was a beautiful experience. I think now if I, if I did it now, you know, I would have a different, you know, take on how I would approach it. But, uh, for that, you know, when I, when I first got in there, we, I remember uh, Boris and Kakowski and I, we, we started thinking of it as more of a small group within a big band. So, mm -hmm. like, if there was a soloist, we were mm -hmm. kind of rocking it out like almost like it was a quartet gig or something like yeah. that or a quintet gig. So, um, yeah, it was just, uh, man, it was a, that was a beautiful experience. I was, I was really yeah. young, but, I, you know, it was great to get in there. And now, you know, and then after that, I was like, oh, man, I can do any band now. I'm cool. Right, right. What, what, what about... That. What about John? Um, one of our um, open studio uh, incredible uh, team members, uh, Brian Fielding, asked, "What was that like, particularly to play with Andy McKee?" Oh man, Andy was was a, a, is, a, is, a, is a great musician, a great bassist. You know, honestly, when I when I was um, when I was in the band, it, for a minute it, it felt weird to lock up with him. It was it was kind of hard. But then, you know, we we kind of sat down and had some discussions. Really? And, and yeah, and and. And he really hit me. He's like, look, man, you know, he kind of hit me to certain things about like how to think about the rhythm and how to think about the time okay. that really I wasn't thinking about, like just how to like internalize time, but then also like being able to be open. And, you know, like if you have, if you've internalized time and you hear it, then you can stretch it and go different places with it. And he was already doing that. And I just, yeah. you know, for me, I was young. I didn't really know. I was inexperienced. Yeah, we're kind I was, of boxing I was, that in. Yeah, I was green. But after we after we sat down and talked about it, it was like, oh shoot! It was just like a new world opened up for me, and it just felt so much easier to 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 mm -hmm. lock with him. And uh, yeah, Andy, I'm I'm gonna see him actually in a couple weeks. I think I'm doing oh, nice. uh, teaching at a uh, jazz house kids. Uh, oh nice! Me. Yeah, so I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to seeing him because I haven't seen him in years. So. Nice. Yeah. And what about man? You know, uh, another thing I was thinking about with a few other names I'm gonna call out. I said, you know, Jonathan plays with all of these. Hard, like I feel like people who write hard music. Um, I was gonna I was gonna say hard ass music, but you know what I mean. And, oh, yeah. and you know another one was uh, like like Ravi Coltrane. You know what have you learned from Ravi? You know because Ravi's music, I I got a chance to play with him a few times, and I mean obviously he's this huge spiritual force, but his music is not easy. You know like what, no, what did you learn from him? You know? Oh man, yeah, yeah, it's it's not easy, man. It's 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 challenging. You know because it's. You know, he's developed his own thing, but it's also coming out of, uh, uh, you know, the great Steve Coleman and the M-Bass. Yeah, uh, the M-Bass so, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, you know, I had, you know, I I, I was, I'm, I'm still a big fan of, of Steve Coleman, so I, I used to check out that band so much, man. I mean, oh, I wow. have, like, stacks and stacks of CDs of all his stuff. And, uh, you know, and there's still stuff I don't really know, <laughs> but, you know, I just, I, I don't know, it was just something about it that it was just so different that I, that I enjoyed it. But with Ravi, man, um, Ravi is such an open player, man. Like he just, you know, he, he trusts your musicality, man. Like he, he mm. when you're in a band, it's like, you know, he, he trusts you to like whatever is written on the paper, you view that as like a blueprint and then you put your own stamp on it. So he mm. gives you kind of car blanche, like, and I and I love that, you know. Definitely, there's certain things where it's like, oh, maybe you can try this, or maybe you can try that. But you know, for the most part, it's just like, man, you're giving like free will, you know. Yeah. And I and I love that because it's like when you know when a when a when a musician trusts you and trusts your musicality, it's like it's like okay, man, this is what this is what we're you know this is what we want to happen because it's like. Right. You know, we're improvising musicians, so it's like when somebody boxes you in, it's like, well, why'd you call me? Like, if you just mm. want to play, if you want to play like this, you could just play with a play along or something like that. Right. But when you, but when you have a musician who's who's so giving, number one, and so open, it just for me, it's just it's it's just been a beautiful experience. Uh, and then, to, you know, and then as of course, as time goes on, as you play with a person for, you know. I mean, we've been playing together since maybe like 2010 or 2011 or something like that. So you start to see different similarities in the way they approach 
they're playing. So um, it's like you almost have like a, a bird's eye view of how he's going to shape right. this before he even does it. Um, right. So uh, that's that's been a beautiful experience to kind of grow musically with him mm -hmm. and and um, and 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 with that band with David Varelis and, and Desron Douglas. You know that that band has grown. Uh, over the years, and we really have developed a, a certain sound, and and that's actually also has changed over the years too. So it's just really been, um, really been beautiful, man. I, I love it. Nice. I love it. So. And, and and I'm gonna close out the sort of talking about you know all of your incredible career. Uh, history and before I say that, you know, please make sure you, uh, you know, before we close out with Jonathan, I, I can't mention everybody he's played with, but please go to his website um, and and check out all the incredible artists that he's worked with. I, I just literally pulled like snapshots, but um, you know, I, I I would be remiss if I didn't mention Maria Schneider mm. um, and and the work you've done. And it's interesting because you and also um, Clarence Penn have you know played with her. I know for years and. I've gotten to see that band, you know, with, with y'all. And it's really something to see just, you know, just how do you evolve with her music? Because, I mean, I've played, you know, with big band. I got I have my own big band. I've done things with strings. But, like, hers is, like, all of that mixed in. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So just, like, maybe quickly, like, can you tell us a little bit about what has she taught you or what have you learned from, from, from making music with her? Oh man, that's that you know that's a that's a hard chair to come into that yeah. drum chair, bro. Yeah. That is that is not an easy one, and um, I do remember like the first rehearsal, man. I got my behind handed to me, man. Yeah. It was like, yeah, you know, but it was like, yeah, I'm like, y'all got that one, y'all keep yeah, that gig, bro. Right, like, <laughs> I almost cur almost called up Clarence, cursing him out, like, what did you get me into, fool? I thought yeah. we were boys, but yeah. <laughs> it's like, why are you trying to end my career? <laughs> um, but man, no, that I mean, because it, it relies so heavily on the drums, man. So it's like, you know, it's not it's it's almost a step further of just, you know, you really have to internalize that music, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing that I noticed even like when I would go, I, I used to hear the band very early on, even before Clarence joined when Tim Horner was in the band. Uh, I used mm. to go see them at Visioni's kind of weekly. Oh, wow. And I was just like, man. And, you know, it was fu funny. Oddly enough, it was like, man. I really love this music. I hope one day I get to play with the band and not knowing that this would ever happen. And so, um, um, and then I remember hearing it later with Clarence and how he shaped it and, and really changed the whole scope. Cause it sounded one way when Tim was in a band and yeah. it was great. And then it kind of morphed into something else. And yeah. when, when Clarence joined and what was interesting to see is like how both of those drummers, like they really, had it had the music so down and so internalized that a lot of times they weren't even looking at the music, yeah. and, and and for me I was like, man, that's what I need to get to, right, you know? right, right. Because if I'm so worried about relying on the picture or on the on the page, then I'm losing what's going on. I'm losing you know the 17 mm -hmm. other members that are in the band right, and, right. and 18 including Maria who's conducting. Right. So I remember one of the things early on was like. You know, she said, just look at me. I'll give it to you. Don't don't worry mm -hmm. about that, you know. And and that kind of was like, okay, that was kind of like the determining factor. It's like, all right, no, I want to get this music down so that I'm not reading anything. And um, okay. and so uh, when I, you know, I did a couple gigs. I think the first show I did was at uh, the Appel Room in, at uh, Lincoln Center. We did two nights there. And... Um, that really gave me an, uh, an idea about how how this band works. You know, it was it was just so beautiful because everybody in that band, and I have to say, a special rest in peace to. Yeah, I was gonna say, Frank. Bro, man, that was my man. Yeah, know? yeah. He was like one of the first cats that was like, man. You know, he saw me like hang going out that rehearsal with my head down. He's like, no, nah, man, yeah. don't do that. You got it. You got it. You cool. Yeah. And so, you know, I just, you know, I, you know, I love him and miss him so much because he, he really was like, yo, man. Come on, we're gonna be cool. And he he was one of the cats that that talked to me about like how to interpret this music. Like you have to, he was saying you have to sit with it, man. You just have to sing it, you know, yeah. get it in your head. And he was, and we, and I remember right before we started recording the music for the for the new record, you know, there was one tune in particular that was like switching meters like every bar. And I was just like, yeah. And he was just like, yo, man, I just I just walk in the park and sing the and sing the line. And I was like, oh, this cat, 
you know, and it was just, a, it was a great way to look yeah. inside how he thinks about approaching music. So for me, it was like, yeah, that, you know, I really wanted to internalize the music like that where I don't have to rely on the paper. And, and I think she appreciated that because now when I go to play, I'm not really thinking about this hit here or this hit there. I'm thinking about the overall picture, like, oh, how are we going to shape this so that it goes there? Right. And what am I going to do? Like, I, you know, I don't want to necessarily play it the way I played it yesterday. Maybe, maybe shape it a little differently. But so the only way to get to that is really is uh, is knowing it that well and and mm. and and, um, and just kind of like internalizing it so that you're not you're not really focused on the page. And you know, for me, it was like she's another one who's who's super giving, like. Um, you know, even from the first couple concerts, like, you know, some of that music had been, they had been playing for years. So I was like, okay, I love the way they, these drummers approach it, but like, how am I going to make it my own? Mm -hmm. So I would start introducing little different things, some rhythmic things, like maybe instead of like playing a straight groove, straight ahead groove here, maybe going into a funk and giving something else mm -hmm. for the solos to think about when they're sewing. And I saw that she was super open about that. Like she was just like, man go ahead you know it, it was mm -hmm. like yeah do that do that i like what you're nice. doing so nice. when you know when i got that okay or when i got that look like oh it's cool then i felt like oh man this is really nice that she's giving me that freedom mm -hmm. to do that so um yeah so i i just uh you know slowly but you know but slowly surely i just started you know really and trying to uh trying to internalize all that music and and, and just mm -hmm. really you know uh, and just really trying to like get it down to the point where it's like I can sing what's happening in bar right. thirteen, you know what I mean, and 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 really know it like that. So, no, oh, uh, beautiful man. Yeah, it's beautiful. hard. But it's, it's 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 necessary, you know. When, were you when you were you doing it, bro? Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Man. But, you know so, that that new music is is was really challenged, but it was it's it's also like because it was such a departure from what she's usually doing, you know, like mm -hmm. you know the it was a, it's a duality of the different worlds, like the, the whole, um, you know, internet world. And, and then when we disconnect from that and get in touch with get back in touch with the natural world. So it was, mm. you know, like trying to balance those two things was challenging, but it, it was a lot of fun to get inside of. Well, clearly you did it, man. I, I want to ask you a couple things before I let you go, man. And I appreciate you being here. Cause I know you, you, I, I know you got eyes on that bed when you oh, man. call. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but um, I, I want to ask you, you know, before we talk about what you have going on now, because you told me something really beautiful that uh, I, I'm so excited to talk about in a second. But before we get to that, what would you say, John, Jonathan, excuse me, is one of the best pieces of advice? And I, and I asked this question to all the drummers that mm -hmm. come on this show, because I think that all of us have had very key advice that shapes who we are you know mm -hmm. and it shapes how we show up because you even as you talked about ravi or maria or tom a lot of those things that make them special is attributed to who they are mm -hmm. and and who we you know like steve teray told me many years ago he said you know if you don't know who you are then you won't know what to play you know he exactly. said who you are is what you play so with that said you know i know like kenny washington told me many years ago make sure you play the drums he said don't don't shortcut the instrument give your all to the instrument and that right. has always lived with me and every stroke that I play. So for you, what is that maybe best piece of advice? It could even be non-drumming advice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Herlin Riley has talked about how someone told him that, you know, you should always, you know, uh, show up for the music. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Nate and different ones talked about something similar. So what would you say for you is the best piece of advice that, that lives with you every day? Well, I think it comes from two different people. It comes from one, my father. And one mm -hmm. of the things that he used to tell me early on is like, you have to be able to wear different hats, man. He says, son, you got to be able to wear different hats. Don't think you're going to just get out here and survive just by playing. So you And you have to develop a lot of different skills, social skills, produ producing skills. You have to, um, you know, social skills. You have to be able to talk to people. And he also said, never be afraid to ask for what you want or what you deserve. Mm. And that kind of just stuck with me because it was like, he's like, only, he's like, only you know your worth. So, if, you know, if you don't speak up, you're just going to get uh, you're going to get railroaded. So he was just like, but he also and this and this really came to to a head when, when we were forced and, you know, when we got, you know, got hit with this pandemic. You know, I, you know, I started thinking back. I was like, man, like, OK, 
I, I can't play, but now I can do this. I can compose mm-hmm. for for people, or I can I can produce somebody's record because mm-hmm. I had those those skills. I developed those skills early on when he told me that, um, and that was that's something that sticks with me to this day. The other thing is um, is something that Rufus Reed told me a long time ago. He was like, I think I was in college. He said, "Don't ever become complacent, and don't and and then he said." Uh, raw talent is only going to get you so far. So you really need to do the necessary work to learn everything about this instrument that you're playing. And that's and that was something that um, uh, that really stuck with me. Like I, you know, I think I was, you know, early on I was really naturally talented, and naturally gifted. You know, stuff I could, like I was saying earlier, stuff I could hear mm-hmm. something and play it back to you. But I remember him saying, like, don't don't just rely on that, man. That's only mm-hmm. going to get you so far. Mm-hmm. So. Um, for me, that's what I do. Like, and and I try to instill that in my students to this day. Especially when I see, you know, some of the talent that's coming out. Like, I really want to be able to want to nurture that and say, look, don't just stop here. Like, you know, go that extra mile if you can do it. And okay. uh, and that's and that's what I, that's what I try to live by. And that, and those are the, the things that have stuck with me. Well, with that said, I, I think, you know, to your father's advice about wearing different hats, um, never being afraid to ask for what you deserve. Uh, Rufus Reed saying raw talent would only get you so far. Um, I, you know, I always like to ask every, you know, uh, interviewee or uh, who's on the call uh, what's going on now. And you just shared with me that you are now a Blue Note recording artist. Yeah. Man. So, man, I, I just have to tell you as a drummer. Um, I'm an advocate for all drummer band leaders. I'm an advocate for everybody, but per- particularly drummer band leaders. And because, you know, the industry tells us that, you know, they we're the stars for other people's bands. They tell right. us that, you know, we're, we're the linchpin for everybody, but that we're not sometimes good enough or popular enough where we don't sell enough records to have our own bands. And so when I see guys like Nate and you and, and, and others doing that, it just makes me so happy and it, it, I'm, you deserve it. So anyway, Blue Note recording artist, you're gonna, oh, I'm gonna man. be borrowing, I'm gonna be borrowing some money from you very soon. <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, man, <laughs> how does it feel, John? Just tell us about that very quickly, because I know you're gonna give us a little taste before yeah. we do the show. But tell, yeah. tell me, what does it feel like to be part of one of the most, le- probably the most legendary jazz record label in the history of this music? Oh man, it's such an honor, and and. Um... You know, and I, it's, I'm really excited about it too, and I can't wait to share the music with everybody. But to just be kind of part of that lineage of, you know, Art Blakey, Tony Williams, Elvin Ooh. Jones, you know what I mean? It's just like, man, I can't believe it. You know, and then more modern, you know, Brian Blade, Bill Stewart, yeah. um, you know, you, you know, even some of my, you know, my peers, Kendrick Scott and, and uh, yeah. Chris Dave, you know, like it's just, yeah. you know, for me, it's just, a beautiful experience to be, um, to have my music come out on, on that, on that label with, with given the history. Um, and you know, and, and it's, and it's, uh, it is, it's definitely a nod to, to, uh, Don, Don was, who is now the president of, of the label. Like he's mm-hmm. really, you know, he's a musician first. So he understands that concept of like really how, to, you know, how to shape the music and, and he knows, he listens to all types of music, man, and so he, you know, he knows what he likes. So, I was just really honored that he, um, that he, he, he took a liking to the stuff that I was doing. Uh, you know, I, I, my thing was like I always wanted to just, you know, I was doing some sideman stuff on, on mm. with with the label. I played on one of Kenny's records came out on there, nice. and I think I played on three of uh, Dr. Lonnie Smith's records that are on there, nice. and I was one of the guys that. You know, who's another one that uh, was has been a great mentor and another, you know, mm-hmm. musical father for me. Um, so for me, it was just like, you know, I just wanted to just build relationships with with people, man. That's that's what I'm yeah. just big at. And um, you know, I when I met Don, I think it was the first record I did with uh, with Doc. We just kind of hit it off, man. And it was it was just really just like. Like almost like you and I just kind of talking. I was like, yeah. you know, and I was just like, man, have you ever checked this record out? You know, it was just more yeah. like that, man. It wasn't, it wasn't be like, yo, I need a deal. Can you hook me up? Right, like, right. You know, it's like, yo, man, yo, have you ever checked this? Cat? Yo, check this cat out. And I was just trying mm-hmm. to hip him to different stuff, and he was hipping me to different stuff. And then it just kind of turned. He's like, yo, man, you know, send me some stuff that you're working on. Like, if if you have anything mm-hmm. that you think I'd be interested. So I have this new group with. Um, 
with Desron Douglas and, and David uh, Varelis and then two, two, actually two Blue Note artists themselves, Joel Ross and Emmanuel Wilkins. Mm-hmm. And I have a band that uh, we premiered at the, uh, first at the Jazz Gallery and then, and then at the Vanguard for a week. Um, and I call the band Pentad because it's, you know, it's a group of five and it's a group of five. Me and Pentad is like a group of, of five, any type of five that come together for like, you know, a common goal or a common, you know, common, mm-hmm. you know, common idea. So that concept, when I got, when I put that band together, it was like, man, it feels like a band filled with people that are really coming together for the common goal. And that's to try to make yeah. uh, the most honest music as possible. So um, cool. after we did the after we did the Vanguard week, I took the band in the studio because the music was, you know, was we had been playing for a week, so it was tight. Yeah. And um, and then um, you know I recorded it, and then I, I I sent it to him to see if he'd be in, you know, if he dug it, man. And he he's like, man, we want to put this record out. I'm I'm really nice. It's it's just really beautiful. So yeah, man, it's 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 a beautiful experience. Um, and you know, I just you know, I just want to be able to do you know the ancestors proud. You know, all yeah. you know, all the ones that recorded before me, especially the drummers. Uh, you know, because like you said, it's I, you know, I'm I'm the same way. I'm like I'm a big advocate for drummer led yeah. bands. You know, for me, like yeah. I feel like drummers like write some of the, the most beautiful music. And another guy that I forgot to mention, who's who's back on there, is uh, the great um, Joe Chambers. Can't forget oh, yeah. about Joe. Yeah, you know, he's yeah. you know he plays that record is killing too. Yeah, you know, and he, and he did one earlier called Mirrors, and then there's you know this new one. Yeah, but he's always been an amazing composer. You know, he plays vibes, and so um, yeah, so and he's on you know you know hundreds of records that came out in yeah. the in the sixties. So you know, for me, it was just like man, I, you know, there was a bit of a pressure for me, I, and I'm putting it on myself, but I just want to you know I just wanted to. You know these ancestors proud that you know that came before so uh, you know i'm hoping that this will were, were you doing that brother and i just want to say thank you man this is the longest interview i've ever done <laughs> i'm sorry man and, and no no I, I say that in a beautiful way in that you, you you're so selfless i mean it's a, it's a tribute to your spirit and how like you know you could easily just be like hey because you know some cats um they be like, hey, hey bro, six, right? <laughs> you know, but you, yeah, they're like, you know. Um, but no, thank you for, and, and it's just a tribute to who you are. And I'm, I celebrate you as my brother and, and a fellow drummer. And uh, we're going to close out. If you could just very uh, quickly, John, just introduce the tune sure. that we're going to hear. And I just want to thank you again for being on here. Everybody, please check out Jonathan Blake. Man, what, please give them your, your website very quickly, uh, John. Uh, sure. The website is... Uh... Jonathan Blake, J O H N A T H A N Blake dot com, and that has Great. all the information, all the dates. Um, the track that you're going to listen to is um, is the title track from the uh, upcoming record. The record comes out uh, October 29th. Um, it's entitled "Homeward Bound," and it's dedicated to our dear friend Jimmy and Nelba uh, Marquise Green's uh, daughter Anna Grace. Uh, Marquise Green, who was unfortunately taken from us in the um, Sandy Hook massacre, um, but you know the title takes its um, comes from something that um, Nelba said when you know when we got the news that her that the daughter had been murdered. Uh, she said that she went home to be with Jesus. So there's the uh, so the title was called um, Homeward Bound, and you know for me it was it was it was kind of a you know, when something that tragic happens, to be able to see some kind of light, you know, for me it was like, man, you know, for her to be able to see, well, she's she's in a better place, she's safe at home with, with Jesus. That, that kind of made me think, like, oh man, like, I don't know if I'll be able to to have that kind of uh, insight, but she did, and so <clears throat> that inspired this tune, Homeward Bound. Cool. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much, and My pleasure, uh, brother. Rachel. And Rachel, I don't know if you had a chance. I would love to to show just a quick picture uh, of Anna's beautiful, beautiful face uh, as we play this tune. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Next week we have uh, some some other wonderful, wonderful musicians. I, I'll pull up a list and, and let you all know who we have coming. I think we...
We got Billy Drummond coming um, soon, um, but I'm just excited. Tune in with us every Wednesday at five o'clock with Open Studio. And if you don't get a chance to check out all of the, you know, these wonderful videos, you can go on Open Studio's channel on YouTube and, and check it out. So thank you all again. And uh, congrats to Jonathan Blake Jr. <laughs> and uh, we're excited and we're going to check a little bit of this music out. Man, thank you, Ulysses, man. And congratulations on the book and everything, man. I'm so proud of what you're doing, man. Thank, thank you. you. Love you, brother. Thank you, brother. Love you too, man. Thank you. Peace.